Chapter 14 Airport Operations Introduction Each time a pilot operates an aircraft, the flight normally begins and ends at an airport. An airport may be a small sod field or a large complex utilized by air carriers. This chapter examines airport operations, identifies features of an airport complex, and provides information on operating on or in the vicinity of an airport. Airport categories The definition for airports refers to any area of land or water used or intended for landing or takeoff of aircraft. This includes, within the five categories of airports listed below, special types of facilities including seaplane bases, heliports, and facilities to accommodate tilt rotor aircraft. An airport includes an area used or intended for airport buildings, facilities, as well as rights of way together with the buildings and facilities. The law defines airports by categories of airport activities, including commercial service, primary, cargo service, reliever, and general aviation airports, as shown below. Commercial service airports, publicly owned airports that have at least 2,500 passenger boardings each calendar year and receive scheduled passenger service. Passenger boardings refer to revenue passenger boardings on an aircraft in service in air commerce whether or not in scheduled service. The definition also includes passengers who continue on an aircraft in international flight that stops at an airport in any of the 50 states for a non-traffic purpose, such as refueling or aircraft maintenance rather than passenger activity. Passenger boardings at airports that receive scheduled passenger service are also referred to as employments. Cargo service airports, airports that, in addition to any other air transportation services that may be available, are served by aircraft providing air transportation of only cargo with a total annual landed weight of more than 100 million pounds. Landed weight means the weight of aircraft transporting only cargo in intrastate, interstate, and foreign air transportation. An airport may be both a commercial service and a cargo service airport. Reliever airports, airports designated by the FAA to relieve congestion at commercial service airports, and to provide improved general aviation access to the overall community. These may be publicly or privately owned. General aviation airports, the remaining airports are commonly described as general aviation airports. This airport type is the largest single group of airports in the U.S. system. The category also includes privately owned, public-use airports that employ 2,500 or more passengers annually and receive scheduled airline service. Types of airports There are two types of airports, towered and non-towered. These types can be further subdivided to civil airports, airports that are open to the general public. Military-slash-federal government airports, airports operated by the military, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, or other agencies of the federal government. Private airports, airports designated for private or restricted use only, not open to the general public. Towered Airport A towered airport has an operating control tower. Air Traffic Control, ATC, is responsible for providing the safe, orderly, and expeditious flow of air traffic at airports where the type of operations and or volume of traffic require such a service. Pilots operating from a towered airport are required to maintain two-way radio communication with ATC and to acknowledge and comply with their instructions. Pilots must advise ATC if they cannot comply with the instructions issued, and request amended instructions. A pilot may deviate from an air traffic instruction in an emergency, but must advise ATC of the deviation as soon as possible. Non-towered airport A non-towered airport does not have an operating control tower. Two-way radio communications are not required, although it is a good operating practice for pilots to transmit their intentions on the specified frequency for the benefit of other traffic in the area. The key to communicating at an airport without an operating control tower is selection of the correct common frequency. The acronym TIF which stands for Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, is synonymous with this program. UCTIF is a frequency designated for the purpose of carrying out airport advisory practices while operating to or from an airport without an operating control tower. VICTIF may be a universal integrated community, Unicom, Multicom, Flight Service Station, FSS, or Tower Frequency and is identified in appropriate aeronautical publications. Unicom is a non-government air-slash-ground radio communication station that may provide airport information at public-use airports where there is no tower or FSS. On pilot request, Unicom stations may provide pilots with weather information, wind direction, the recommended runway, or other necessary information. If the Unicom frequency is designated as the TIF, it is identified in appropriate aeronautical publications. Figure 14-1 to lists recommended communication procedures. 
More information regarding radio communications is provided later in this chapter. Non-towered airport traffic patterns are always entered at pattern altitude. How you enter the pattern depends upon the direction of arrival. The preferred method for entering from the downwind side of the pattern is to approach the pattern on a course 45 degrees to the downwind leg and join the pattern at midfield. There are several ways to enter the pattern if you're coming from the upwind leg side of the airport. One method of entry from the opposite side of the pattern is to announce your intentions and cross over midfield at least 500 feet above. Pattern altitude, normally 1,500 feet AGL. However, if large or turbine aircraft operate at your airport, it is best to remain 2,000 feet AGL so you are not in conflict with their traffic pattern. When well clear of the pattern, approximately 2 miles scan carefully for traffic, descend to pattern altitude, then turn right to enter at 45 degrees to the downwind leg at midfield. Figure 14-2, an alternate method is to enter on a midfield crosswind at pattern altitude, carefully scan for traffic, announce your intentions, and then turn downwind. Figure 14-3, this technique should not be used if the pattern is busy. Always remember to give way to aircraft on the preferred 45 degrees entry and to aircraft already established on downwind. In either case, it is vital to announce your intentions, and remember to scan outside. Before joining the downwind leg, adjust your course or speed to blend into the traffic. Adjust power on the downwind leg, or sooner, to fit into the flow of traffic. Avoid flying too fast or too slow. Speeds recommended by the airplane manufacturer should be used. They will generally fall between 70 to 80 knots for fixed gear singles and 80 to 90 knots for high performance retractable. Sources for airport data when a pilot flies into a different airport it is important to review the current data for that airport. This data provides the pilot with information, such as communication frequencies, services available, closed runways, or airport construction. Three common sources of information are Aeronautical Charts, Chart Supplement US, formerly Airport Slash Facility Directory, Notices to Airmen, NOTAMS, Automated Terminal Information Service, ATIS, Aeronautical Charts, Aeronautical Charts provide specific information on airports. Chapter 16, Navigation, contains an excerpt from an aeronautical chart and an aeronautical chart legend, which provides guidance on interpreting the information on the chart. Chart Supplement U.S., formerly Airport Slash Facility Directory, the Chart Supplement U.S., formerly Airport Slash Facility Directory, provides the most comprehensive information on a given airport. It contains information on airports, heliports, and seaplane bases that are open to the public. The Chart Supplement U.S. is published in seven books, which are organized by regions and are revised every 56 days. The Chart Supplement U.S. is also available digitally at www.fa. Excerpt from a Directory For a complete listing of information provided in a Chart Supplement U.S. and how the information may be decoded, refer to the legend sample located in the front of each Chart Supplement U.S. In addition to airport information, each chart supplement U.S. contains information such as special notices, Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, and National Weather Service, NWS, telephone numbers, preferred instrument flight rules, IFR, routing, visual flight rules, VFR, waypoints, a listing of very high frequency, VHF, omnidirectional range, VOR, receiver checkpoints, aeronautical chart bulletins, land and hold short operations, LASO, for selected airports. Airport Diagrams for Selected Towered Airports, On Route Flight Advisory Service, EFAS, Outlets, Parachute Jumping Areas, and Facility Telephone Numbers. It is beneficial to review a chart supplement U.S. to become familiar with the information it contains. Notices to Airmen Notum, Time Critical Aeronautical Information, which is of a temporary nature or not sufficiently known in advance to permit publication, on aeronautical charts or in other operational. Publications receives immediate dissemination by the NOTAM system. The NOTAM information could affect your decision to make the flight. It includes such information as taxiway and runway closures, construction, communications, changes in status of navigational aids, and other information essential to planned on route, terminal, or landing operations. Exercise good judgment and common sense by carefully regarding the information readily available in NOTAMs. Prior to any flight, pilots should check for any NOTAMs that could affect their intended flight. For more information on NOTAMs, refer back to Chapter 1, Pilot and Aeronautical Information Section. Automated Terminal Information Service, ATIS, the Automated Terminal Information Service, ATIS, 
is a recording of the local weather conditions and other pertinent non-control information broadcast on a local frequency in a loop format. It is normally updated once per hour but is updated more often when changing local conditions warrant. Important information is broadcast on ATIS including weather, runways in use, specific ATC procedures, and any airport construction activity that could affect taxi planning. When the ATIS is recorded, it is given a code. This code is changed with every ATIS update. For example, ATIS Alpha is replaced by ATIS Bravo. The next hour, ATIS Charlie is recorded, followed by ATIS Delta and progresses down the alphabet. Prior to calling ATC, tune to the ATIS frequency and listen to the recorded broadcast. The broadcast ends with a statement containing the ATIS code. For example, advise on initial contact, you have information Bravo. Upon contacting the tower controller, state information Bravo was received. This allows the tower controller to verify the pilot has the current local weather and airport information without having to state it all to each pilot who calls. This also clears the tower frequency from being overtaken by the constant relay of the same information, which would result without an ATIS broadcast. The use of ATIS broadcasts at departure and arrival airports is not only a sound practice but a wise decision. Airport markings and signs There are markings and signs used at airports that provide directions and assist pilots in airport operations. It is important for you to know the meanings of the signs, markings, and lights that are used on airports as surface navigational aids. All airport markings are painted on the surface, whereas some signs are vertical and some are painted on the surface. An overview of the most common signs and markings are described on the following pages. Additional information may be found in Chapter 2, Aeronautical Lighting and Other Airport Visual Aids, of the Aeronautical Information Manual, AIM. Runway markings and signs Runway markings vary depending on the type of operations conducted at the airport. A basic VFR runway may only have centerline markings and runway numbers. Refer to Appendix C of this publication for an example of the most common runway markings that are found at airports. Since aircraft are affected by the wind during takeoffs and landings, runways are laid out according to the local prevailing winds. Runway numbers are in reference to magnetic north. Certain airports have two or even three runways laid out in the same direction. These are referred to as parallel runways and are distinguished by a letter added to the runway number, for example, runway 36 liters left, 36 C center, and 36 R right. Relocated runway threshold it is sometimes necessary, due to construction or runway maintenance, to close only a portion of a runway. When a portion of a runway is closed, the runway threshold is relocated as necessary. It is referred to as a relocated threshold and methods for identifying the relocated threshold vary. A common way for the relocated threshold to be marked is a 10-foot wide white bar across the width of the runway. Figure 14 5 A and B, when the threshold is relocated, the closed portion of the runway is not available for use by aircraft for takeoff or landing, but it is available for taxi. When a threshold is relocated, it closes not only a set portion of the approach end of a runway, but also shortens the length of the opposite direction runway. Yellow arrowheads are placed across the width of the runway just prior to the threshold bar. Displace threshold A displace threshold is a threshold located at a point on the runway other than the designated beginning of the runway. Displacement of a threshold reduces the length of runway available for landings. The portion of runway behind a displace threshold is available for takeoffs in either direction, or landings from the opposite direction. A 10 feet wide white threshold bar is located across the width of the runway at the displaced threshold, and white arrows are located along the center line in the area between the beginning of the runway and displaced threshold. White arrowheads are located across the width of the runway just prior to the threshold bar. Figure 14 6A and B. Runway safety area The runway safety area, RSA, is a defined surface surrounding the runway prepared, or suitable, for reducing the risk of damage to airplanes in the event of an undershoot, overshoot, or excursion from the runway. The dimensions of the RSA vary and can be determined by using the criteria contained within AC 155300-13, Airport Design, Chapter 3. Figure 3-1 in AC 155300-13 depicts the RSA. Additionally, it provides greater accessibility for firefighting and rescue equipment in emergency situations. The RSA is typically graded and mowed. The lateral boundaries are usually identified by the presence of the runway holding position signs and markings on the adjoining taxiway steps. Aircraft should not enter the RSA without making sure of adequate separation from other aircraft during operations at uncontrolled airports. Figure 14 7, 
Some taxiway stubs also have a runway safety area boundary sign that faces the runway and is visible to you only when exiting the runway. This sign has a yellow background with black markings and is typically used at towered airports where a controller commonly requests you to report clear of a runway. This sign is intended to provide you with another visual cue that is used as a guide to determine when you are clear of the runway safety boundary area. The sign shown in figure 14.8 is what you would see when exiting the runway at taxiway kilo. You are out of the runway safety area boundary when the entire aircraft passes the sign and the accompanying surface painted marking. Runway holding position sign noncompliance with a runway holding position sign may result in the FAA filing a pilot deviation against you. A. Runway holding position sign is an airport version of a stop sign. Figure 14.9, it may be seen as a sign and or its characters painted on the airport pavement. The sign has white characters outlined in black on a red background. It is always collocated with the surface painted holding position markings and is located where taxiways intersect runways. On taxiways that intersect the threshold of the takeoff runway, only the designation of the runway may appear on the sign. If a taxiway intersects a runway somewhere other than at the threshold, the sign has the designation of the intersecting runway. The runway numbers on the sign are arranged to correspond to the relative location of the respective runway thresholds. Figure 14 to 10 shows 18 to 36 to indicate the threshold for runway 18 is to the left and the threshold for Alpha location sign. Runway 36 is to the right. The sign also indicates that you are located on taxiway alpha. If the runway holding position sign is located on a taxiway at the intersection of two runways, the designations for both runways are shown on the sign along with arrows showing the approximate alignment of each runway. Figure 1411A and B in addition to showing the approximate runway alignment, the arrows indicate the directions to the threshold of the runway whose designation is immediately next to each corresponding arrow. This type of taxiway and runway slash runway intersection geometry can be very confusing and create navigational challenges. Extreme caution must be exercised when taxiing onto or crossing this type of intersection. Figure 1411A and B shows a depiction of a taxiway, runway slash runway intersection, and is also designated as a hot spot on the airport diagram. In the example, taxiway Bravo intersects with two runways, 31 to 13 and 35 to 17, which cross each other. Surface painted runway holding position signs may also be used to aid you in determining the holding position. These markings consist of white characters on a red background and are painted on the left side of the taxiway centerline. Figure 14 to 12 shows a surface painted runway holding position sign that is the holding point for runway 32 or 14 liters. You should never allow any part of your aircraft to cross the runway holding position sign, either a vertical or surface painted sign, without a clearance from ATC. Doing so poses a hazard to yourself and others. When the tower is closed or you're operating at a non-towered airport, you may taxi past a runway holding position sign only when the runway is clear of aircraft, and there are no aircraft on final approach. You may then proceed with extreme caution. Runway holding position marking non-compliance with a runway holding position marking may result in the FAA filing a pilot deviation against you. Runway holding position markings consist of four yellow lines, two solid and two dashed, that are painted on the surface and extend across the width of the taxiway to indicate where the aircraft should stop when approaching a runway. These markings are painted across the entire taxiway pavement, are in alignment, and are collocated with the holding position sign as described above. As you approach the runway, two solid yellow lines and two dashed lines will be visible. Prior to reaching the solid lines, it is imperative to stop and ensure that no portion of the aircraft intersects the first solid yellow line. Do not cross the double solid lines until a clearance from ATC has been received. Figure 1413 when the tower is closed or when operating at a non-towered airport, you may taxi onto or across the runway only when the runway is clear and there are no aircraft on final approach. You should use extreme caution when crossing or taxiing onto the runway and always look both ways. When exiting the runway, the same markings will be seen except the aircraft will be approaching the double dash lines. Figure 1414, in order to be clear of the runway, the entire aircraft must cross both the dashed and solid lines. An ATC clearance is not needed to cross this marking when exiting the runway. Runway distance remaining signs Runway distance remaining signs have a black background with a white number and may be installed along one or both sides of the runway. Figure 14 to 15, the number on the signs indicates the distance, and thousands of feet, of landing runway remaining. The last sign, 
which has the numeral 1, is located at least 950 feet from the runway end. Runway designation marking runway numbers and letters are determined from the approach direction. The runway number is the whole number nearest one-tenth the magnetic azimuth of the centerline of the runway, measured clockwise from the magnetic north. In the case where there are parallel runways, the letters differentiate between left, L, right, R, or center C. Figure 1416, for example, if there are two parallel runways, they would show the designation number and then either L or R beneath it. For three parallel runways, the designation number would be presented with L, C, or R beneath it. Is required to cross. Land and hold short operations, lasso, when simultaneous operations, takeoffs and landings, are being conducted on intersecting runways, land and hold short operations, lasso, may also be in effect. Lasso is an ATC procedure that may require your participation and compliance. As pilot in command, PIC, you have the final authority to accept or decline any LASO clearance. If issued a land and hold short clearance, you must be aware of the reduced runway distances and whether or not you can comply before accepting the clearance. You do not have to accept a LASO clearance. Pilots should only receive a LASO clearance when there is a minimum ceiling of 1,000 feet and 3 statute miles of visibility. Runway holding position signs and markings are installed on those runways used for LASO. The signs and markings are placed at the Lasso point to aid you in determining where to stop and hold the aircraft, and are located prior to the runway-slash-runway -runway intersection. Figure 1417, the holding position sign has a white inscription with black border around the numbers on a red background and is installed adjacent to the holding position markings. If you accept a land and hold short clearance, you must comply so that no portion of the aircraft extends beyond these hold markings. If receiving clear-to-land instructions from ATC, you are authorized to use the entire landing length of the runway and should disregard any LASO holding position markings located on the runway. If you receive and accept LASO instructions, you must stop short of the intersecting runway prior to the LASO signs and markings. Below is a list of items which, if thoroughly understood and complied with, will ensure that LASO operations are conducted properly. No landing distance available. Be advised by ATC as to why LASO are being conducted. Know what signs and markings are at the LASO point. LASO are not authorized for student pilots who are performing a solo flight. At many airports air carrier aircraft are not authorized to participate in LASO if the other aircraft is a general aviation aircraft. Generally, LASO are not authorized at night. LASO are not authorized on wet runways. Runway 36 or stop at the holding position prior to runway 23. Taxiway markings and signs Taxiway direction signs have a yellow background and black characters, which identifies the designation or intersecting taxiways. Arrows indicate the direction of turn that would place the aircraft on the designated taxiway. Figure 14-18, direction signs are normally located on the left side of the taxiway and prior to the intersection. These signs and markings, with a yellow background and black characters, indicate the direction toward a different taxiway, leading off a runway, or out of an intersection. Figure 1418 shows taxiway Delta and how taxiway Bravo intersects ahead at 90 degrees both left and right. Taxiway direction signs can also be displayed as surface painted markings. Figure 14 to 19 shows taxiway Bravo is proceeding straight ahead while taxiway Alpha turns to the right at approximately 45 degrees. Sign indicates a turn, the sign is located prior to the intersection. Figure 1420A and B shows an example of a direction sign at a complex taxiway intersection. Figure 1420A and B shows taxiway Bravo intersects with taxiway Sierra at 90 degrees, but at 45 degrees with taxiway Foxtrot. This type of array can be displayed with or without the taxiway location sign, which in this case would be taxiway Bravo. Enhanced taxiway centerline markings at most towered airports. The enhanced taxiway centerline marking is used to warn you of an upcoming runway. It consists of yellow dash lines on either side of the normal solid taxiway center line, and the dashes extend up to 150 feet prior to a runway holding position marking. Figure 1421A and B, they are used to aid you in maintaining awareness during surface movement to reduce runway incursions. Destination signs Destination signs have black characters on a yellow background indicating a destination at the airport. These signs always have an arrow showing the direction of the taxi route to that destination. Figure 1422, when the arrow on the destination sign indicates a turn, 
the sign is located prior to the intersection. Destinations commonly shown on these types of signs include runways, aprons, terminals, military areas, civil aviation areas, cargo areas, international areas, and fixed base operators. When the inscription for two or more destinations having a common taxi route are placed on a sign, the destinations are separated by a dot, and one arrow would be used as shown in figure 1422. When the inscription on a sign contains two or more destinations having different taxi routes, each destination is accompanied by an arrow and separated from the other destinations on the sign with a vertical black message divider as shown in figure 1423. The example shown in figure 1423 shows two signs. The sign in the foreground explains that runway 20 threshold is to the left, and runways 32, 2, and 14 are to the right. The sign in the background indicates that you're located on Taxiway Bravo and Taxiway November will take you to those runways. Holding position signs and markings for an instrument landing system, ILS, critical area the instrument landing system, ILS, broadcasts signals to arriving instrument aircraft to guide them to the runway. Each of these ILSs have critical areas that must be kept clear of all obstacles in order to ensure quality of the broadcast signal. At many airports, taxiways extend into the ILS critical area. Most of the time, this is of no concern, however, during times of poor weather, an aircraft on approach may depend on a good signal quality. When necessary, ATC will protect the ILS critical area for arrival instrument traffic by instructing taxiing aircraft to hold short of runway, 20, ILS critical area. The ILS critical area hold sign is white characters, outlined in black, on a red background and is installed adjacent to the ILS holding position markings. Figure 1424, the holding position markings for the ILS critical area appear on the pavement as a horizontal yellow ladder extending across the width of the taxiway. When instructed to hold short of runway, 20, ILS critical area, you must ensure no portion of the aircraft extends beyond these markings. Figure 14-25, if ATC does not instruct you to hold at this point, then you may bypass the ILS critical area hold position markings and continue with your taxi. Figure 1424 shows that the ILS hold sign is located on taxiway golf and the ILS ladder hold position marking is adjacent to the hold sign. Figure 1421. A. Enhanced taxiway centerline marking. B. Enhanced taxiway centerline marking and runway holding position marking. Holding position markings for taxiway slash taxiway intersections Holding position markings for taxiway slash taxiway intersections consist of a single dashed yellow line extending across the width of the taxiway. Figure 1426, they are painted on taxiways where ATC normally holds aircraft short of a taxiway intersection. When instructed by ATC hold short of taxiway X, you should stop so that no part of your aircraft extends beyond the holding position marking. When the marking is not present, you should stop your aircraft at a point that provides adequate clearance from an aircraft on the intersecting taxiway. Marking and lighting of permanently closed runways and taxiways for runways and taxiways that are permanently closed, the lighting circuits are disconnected. The runway threshold, runway designation, and touchdown markings are obliterated and yellow X's are placed at each end of the runway and at 1,000 foot intervals. Temporarily closed runways and taxiways for temporarily closed runways and taxiways, a visual indication is often provided with yellow X's or raised lighted yellow X's placed at each end of the runway. Depending on the reason for the closure, duration of closure, airfield configuration, and the existence and the hours of operation of an ATC tower, a visual indication may not be present. As discussed previously in the chapter, you must always check notams and addis for runway and taxiway closure information. Figure 1427A shows an example of a yellow X laid flat with an adequate number of heavy sand bags to keep the wind from getting under and displacing the vinyl material. A very effective and preferable visual aid to depict temporary closure is the lighted X placed on or near the runway designation numbers. Figure 1427B and C, this device is much more discernible to approaching aircraft than the other materials described above. Other markings Some other markings found on the airport include vehicle roadway markings, VOR receiver checkpoint markings, and non-movement area boundary markings. Airport signs There are six types of signs that may be found at airports. The more complex the layout of an airport, the more important the signs become to pilots. Appendix C of this publication shows examples of some signs that are found at most airports, their purpose, and appropriate pilot action. The six types of signs are Mandatory instruction signs Red background with white inscription. These signs denote an entrance to a runway, critical area, or prohibited area. 
C. Lighted X at night showing a temporarily closed runway. Location signs, black with yellow inscription and a yellow border, no arrows. They are used to identify a taxiway or runway location, to identify the boundary of the runway, or identify an instrument landing system, ILS, critical area. Direction signs, yellow background with black inscription. The inscription identifies the designation of the intersecting taxiways leading out of an intersection. Destination signs, yellow background with black inscription and arrows. These signs provide information on locating areas, such as runways, terminals, cargo areas, and civil aviation areas. Information signs, yellow background with black inscription. These signs are used to provide the pilot with information on areas that cannot be seen from the control tower, applicable radio frequencies, and noise abatement procedures. The airport operator determines the need, size, and location of these signs. Runway distance remaining signs, black background with white numbers. The numbers indicate the distance of the remaining runway in thousands of feet. Airport lighting The majority of airports have some type of lighting for night operations. The variety and type of lighting systems depends on the volume and complexity of operations at a given airport. Airport lighting is standardized so that airports use the same light colors for runways and taxiways. Airport beacon Airport beacons help a pilot identify an airport at night. The beacons are normally operated from dusk until dawn. Sometimes they are turned on if the ceiling is less than 1,000 feet and or the ground visibility is less than 3 statute miles, VFR minimums. However, there is no requirement for this, so a pilot has the responsibility of determining if the weather meets VFR requirements. The beacon has a vertical light distribution to make it most effective from 1 to 10 degrees above the horizon, although it can be seen well above or below this spread. The beacon may be an omnidirectional capacitor discharge device, or it may rotate at a constant speed, that produces the visual effect of flashes at regular intervals. The combination of light colors from an airport beacon indicates the type of airport. Figure 1428, some of the most common beacons are. Flashing white and green for civilian land airports, flashing white and yellow for a water airport, flashing white, yellow, and green for a heliport, Two quick white flashes alternating with a green flash identifying a military airport approach light systems approach light systems are primarily intended to provide a means to transition from instrument flight to visual flight for landing. The system configuration depends on whether the runway is a precision or non-precision instrument runway. Some systems include sequenced flashing lights that appear to the pilot as a ball of light traveling toward the runway at high speed. Approach lights can also aid pilots operating under VFR at night. Visual glide slope indicators Visual glide slope indicators provide the pilot with glide path information that can be used for day or night approaches. By maintaining the proper glide path as provided by the system, a pilot should have adequate obstacle clearance and should touch down within a specified portion of the runway. Visual approach slope indicator, VASI, VASI installations are the most common visual glide path systems in use. The VASI provides obstruction clearance within 10 degrees of the extended runway centerline up to 4 nautical miles, NM, from the runway threshold. The VASI consists of light units arranged in bars. There are 2 bar and 3 bar VASIs. The 2 bar VASI has near and far light bars and the 3 bar VASI has near, middle, and far light bars. 2 bar VASI installations provide one visual glide path that is normally set at 3 degrees. The 3 bar system provides two glide paths, the lower glide path normally set at 3 degrees, and the upper glide path one quarter degree above the lower glide path. The basic principle of the VASI is that of color differentiation between red and white. Each light unit projects a beam of light, a white segment in the upper part of the beam and a red segment in the lower part of the beam. The lights are arranged so the pilot sees the combination of light shown in figure 1429 to indicate below, on, or above the glide path. Other glide path systems are precision approach path indicator, PAPI, uses lights similar to the VASI system, except they are installed in a single row, normally on the left side of the runway. Figure 1430 A tri-color system consists of a single light unit projecting a three-color visual approach path. Below the glide path is indicated by red, on the glide path is indicated by green, and above the glide path is indicated by amber. When descending below the glide path, there is a small area of dark amber. Pilots should not mistake this area for an above-the-glide path indication. Figure 1431, 
Pulsating VASIs normally consist of a single light unit projecting a two-color visual approach path into the final approach area of the runway upon which the indicator is installed. The on-glide path indication is a steady white light. The slightly below glide path indication is a steady red light. If the aircraft descends further below the glide path, the red light starts to pulsate. The above glide path indication is a pulsating white light. The pulsating rate increases as the aircraft gets further above or below the desired glide slope. The useful range of the system is about 4 miles during the day and up to 10 miles at night. Figure 1432, runway lighting There are various lights that identify parts of the runway complex. These assist a pilot in safely making a takeoff or landing during night operations. Runway and identifier lights, REIL, runway and identifier lights, REIL, are installed at many airfields to provide rapid and positive identification of the approach end of a particular runway. The system consists of a pair of synchronized flashing lights located laterally on each side of the runway threshold. Reels may be either omnidirectional or unidirectional facing the approach area. Runway edge lights Runway edge lights are used to outline the edges of runways at night or during low visibility conditions. Figure 1433, these lights are classified according to the intensity they are capable of producing, High Intensity Runway Lights, HIRL, Medium Intensity Runway Lights, MIRL, and Low Intensity Runway Lights, LIRL. The HIRL and MERL have variable intensity settings. These lights are white, except on instrument runways where amber lights are used on the last 2,000 feet or half the length of the runway, whichever is less. The lights marking the end of the runway are red. In Runway Lighting Runway Centerline Lighting System, RCLS installed on some precision approach runways to facilitate landing under adverse visibility conditions. They are located along the runway centerline and are spaced at 50-foot intervals. When viewed from the landing threshold, the runway centerline lights are white until the last 3,000 feet of the runway. The white lights begin to alternate with red for the next 2,000 feet. For the remaining 1,000 feet of the runway, all centerline lights are red. Touchdown Zone Lights TDZL installed on some precision approach runways to indicate the touchdown zone when landing under adverse visibility conditions. They consist of two rows of transverse light bars disposed symmetrically about the runway centerline. The system consists of steady burning white lights that start 100 feet beyond the landing threshold and extend to 3,000 feet beyond the landing threshold or to the midpoint of the runway, whichever is less. Taxiway centerline leadoff lights provide visual guidance to persons exiting the runway. They are color-coded to warn pilots and vehicle drivers that they are within the runway environment or ILS critical area, whichever is more restrictive. Alternate green and yellow lights are installed, beginning with green, from the runway centerline to one centerline light position beyond the runway holding position or ILS critical area holding position. Taxiway centerline lead and lights provide visual guidance to persons entering the runway. These lead in lights are also color-coded with the same color pattern as lead-off lights to warn pilots and vehicle drivers that they are within the runway environment or ILS critical area, whichever is more conservative. The fixtures used for lead in lights are bidirectional, i.e., one side emits light for the lead in function while the other side emits light for the lead-off function. Any fixture that emits yellow light for the lead-off function also emits yellow light for the lead in function. Land and hold short lights, used to indicate the hold short point on certain runways which are approved for lasso. Land and hold short lights consist of a row of pulsing white lights installed across the runway at the hold short point. Where installed, the lights are on any time lasso is in effect. These lights are off when lasso is not in effect. Control of airport lighting Airport lighting is controlled by ATC at towered airports. At non-towered airports, the lights may be on a timer, or where an FSS is located at an airport. The FSS personnel may control the lighting. A pilot may request various light systems be turned on or off and also request a specified intensity, if available, from ATC or FSS personnel. At selected non-towered airports, the pilot may control the lighting by using the radio. This is done by selecting a specified frequency and clicking the radio microphone. Figure 1434, for information on pilot-controlled lighting at various airports, Refer to the Chart Supplement U.S., formerly Airport Slash Facility Directory. Taxiway lights similar to runway lighting, taxiways also have various lights which help pilots identify areas of the taxiway and any surrounding runways. Omnidirectional Omnidirectional taxiway lights outline the edges of the taxiway and are blue in color. 
At many airports, these edge lights may have variable intensity settings that may be adjusted by an ATC when deemed necessary or when requested by the pilot. Some airports also have taxiway centerline lights that are green in color. Clearance bar lights Clearance bar lights are installed at holding positions on taxiways in order to increase the conspicuity of the holding position in low visibility conditions. They may also be installed to indicate the location of an intersecting taxiway during periods of darkness. Clearance bars consist of three and pavement steady burning yellow lights. Runway guard lights Runway guard lights are installed at taxiway slash runway intersections. They are primarily used to enhance the conspicuity of taxiway slash runway intersections during low visibility conditions, but may be used in all weather conditions. Runway guard lights consist of either a pair of elevated flashing yellow lights installed on either side of the taxiway, or a row of in-pavement yellow lights installed across the entire taxiway, at the runway holding position marking. Note, some airports may have a row of three or five in-pavement yellow lights installed at taxiway slash runway intersections. They should not be confused with clearance bar lights described previously in this section. Stop bar lights Stop bar lights, when installed, are used to confirm the ATC clearance to enter or cross the active runway in low visibility conditions, below 1,200 feet runway visual range, RVR. A stop bar consists of a row of red, unidirectional, steady burning and pavement lights installed across the entire taxiway at the runway holding position, and elevated steady burning red lights on each side. A controlled stop bar is operated in conjunction with the taxiway centerline LED and lights which extend from the stop bar toward the runway. Following the ATC clearance to proceed, the stop bar is turned off and the LED and lights are turned on. The stop bar and LED and lights are automatically reset by a sensor or backup timer. Obstruction lights Obstructions are marked or lighted to warn pilots of their presence during daytime and nighttime conditions. Obstruction lighting can be found both on and off an airport to identify obstructions. They may be marked or lighted in any of the following conditions. Red obstruction lights, flash or emit a steady red color during nighttime operations, and the obstructions are painted orange and white for daytime operations. High-intensity white obstruction lights, flash high-intensity white lights during the daytime with the intensity reduced for nighttime. Dual lighting, a combination of flashing red beacons and steady red lights for nighttime operation and high-intensity white lights for daytime operations. New lighting technology is a top priority of the FAA is to continue to enhance airport safety while maintaining airport capacity. Reducing runway incursions is a major component of this effort. Runway incursions develop quickly and without warning during routine traffic situations on the airport surface, leaving little time for corrective action. The Runway Status Lights, RWSL, system is designed to provide a direct indication to you that it is unsafe to enter a runway, cross a runway or take off from or land on a runway when the system is activated. Runway status lights are red in color and indicate runway status only. They do not indicate clearance to enter a runway or clearance to take off. The RWSL system provides warning lights on runways and taxiways, illuminating when it is unsafe to enter cross or begin takeoff on a runway. Currently, there are two types, runway entrance lights, REL, and takeoff hold lights, PHL. Figures 14 to 35 and 14 to 36, REL provide a warning to aircraft crossing or entering a runway from intersecting taxiways that there is conflicting traffic on the runway. THL provide a warning signal to aircraft in position for takeoff that the runway is occupied and is unsafe to take off. As of 2016, the RWSL system is operational at 14 of the nation's busiest airports with three more airports scheduled to receive the system by 2017. Wind direction indicators It is important for a pilot to know the direction of the wind. At facilities with an operating control tower, this information is provided by ATC. Information may also be provided by FSS personnel either located at a particular airport or remotely available through a remote communication outlet, RCO, or by requesting information on active airports that have the capacity to receive and broadcast on this frequency. When none of these services is available, it is possible to determine wind direction and runway in use by visual wind indicators. A pilot should check these wind indicators even when information is provided on the TIF at a given airport because there is no assurance that the information provided is accurate. The wind direction indicator can be a wind cone, wind sock tetrahedron, or wind T. These are usually located in a central location near the runway and may be placed in the center of a segmented circle, which identifies the traffic pattern direction if it is other than the standard left-hand pattern. Figures 14 to 37 and 14 to 38, 
The wind sock is a good source of information since it not only indicates wind direction but allows the pilot to estimate the wind velocity and or gust factor. The wind sock extends out straighter in strong winds and tends to move back and forth when the wind is gusting. Wind tees and tetrahedrons can swing freely and align themselves with the wind direction. Since a wind tee or tetrahedron can also be manually set to align with the runway in use, a pilot should also look at the wind sock for wind information, if one is available. Traffic patterns at airports without an operating control tower, a segmented circle visual indicator system, if installed, is designed to provide traffic pattern information. Figure 1438, usually located in a position affording maximum visibility to pilots in the air and on the ground and providing a centralized location for other elements of the system, the segmented circle consists of the following components, wind direction indicators, landing direction indicators, landing strip indicators, and traffic pattern indicators. A tetrahedron is installed to indicate the direction of landings and takeoffs when conditions at the airport warrant its use. It may be located at the center of a segmented circle and may be lighted for night operations. The small end of the tetrahedron points in the direction of landing. Pilots are cautioned against using a tetrahedron for any purpose other than as an indicator of landing direction. At airports with control towers, the tetrahedron should only be referenced when the control tower is not in operation. Tower instructions supersede tetrahedron indications. Landing strip indicators are installed in pairs and are used to show the alignment of landing strips. Figure 1438, traffic pattern indicators are arranged in pairs in conjunction with landing strip indicators and used to indicate the direction of turns when there is a variation from the normal left traffic pattern. If there is no segmented circle installed at the airport, traffic pattern indicators may be installed on or near the end of the runway. At most airports and military air bases, traffic pattern altitudes for propeller-driven aircraft generally extend from 600 feet to as high as 1,500 feet above ground level AGL. Pilots can obtain the traffic pattern altitude for an airport from the chart supplement US, formerly airport slash facility directory. Also, traffic pattern altitudes for military turbojet aircraft sometimes extend up to 2,500 feet AGL. Therefore, pilots of on-route aircraft should be constantly on alert for other aircraft in traffic patterns and avoid these areas whenever possible. When operating at an airport, traffic pattern altitudes should be maintained unless otherwise required by the applicable distance from cloud criteria according to Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR, Part 91, Section 91.155. Additional information on airport traffic pattern operations. can be found in Chapter 4, Air Traffic Control, of the AIM. Pilots can find traffic pattern information and restrictions, such as noise abatement in the chart supplement US, formerly airport slash facility directory. Example, key to traffic pattern operations, single runway 1. Enter pattern and level flight, abeam the midpoint of the runway, at pattern altitude. 1000 AGL is recommended pattern altitude unless otherwise established. Figure 1439, the landing runway on downwind leg. Figure 1439, 3. Complete turn to final at least one quarter mile from the runway. Figure 1439, 4. After takeoff or go around, continue straight ahead until beyond departure end of runway. Figure 1439, 5. If remaining in the traffic pattern, commence turn to crosswind leg beyond the departure end of the runway within 300 feet of pattern altitude. Figure 1439, 6. If departing the traffic pattern, continue straight out, or exit with a 45 degrees turn, to the left when in a left-hand traffic pattern, to the right when in a right-hand traffic pattern, beyond the departure end of the runway, after reaching pattern altitude. Figure 1439, example, key to traffic pattern operations, parallel runways 1. Enter pattern and level flight, abeam the midpoint of the runway, at pattern altitude. 1000 AGL is recommended pattern altitude unless otherwise established. Figure 1442. Maintain pattern altitude until a beam approach end of the landing runway on downwind leg. Figure 1443. Complete turn to final at least one quarter mile from the runway. Figure 1444. Do not overshoot final or continue on a track that penetrates the final approach of the parallel runway 5. After takeoff or go around, continue straight ahead until beyond departure end of runway. Figure 1440. Application of Traffic Pattern Indicator 6. If remaining in the traffic pattern, commence turn to crosswind leg beyond the departure end of the runway within 300 feet of pattern altitude. 
Figure 1447. If departing the traffic pattern, continue straight out, or exit with a 45 degrees turn, to the left when in a left-hand traffic pattern, to the right when in a right-hand traffic pattern, beyond the departure end of the runway, after reaching pattern altitude. Figure 1440, 8. Do not continue on a track that penetrates the departure path of the parallel runway. Figure 1440, radio communications operating in and out of a towered airport, as well as in a good portion of the airspace system, requires that an aircraft have two-way radio communication capability. For this reason, a pilot should be knowledgeable of radio station license requirements and radio communications equipment and procedures. Radio license There is no license requirement for a pilot operating in the United States, however, a pilot who operates internationally is required to hold a restricted radio telephone permit issued by the Federal Communications Commission, FCC. There is also no station license requirement for most general aviation aircraft operating in the United States. A station license is required, however, for an aircraft that is operating internationally, that uses other than a VHF radio, and that meets other criteria. Radio equipment in general aviation, the most common types of radios are VHF. A VHF radio operates on frequencies between 118.0 MHz, MHz, and 136.975 MHz and is classified as 720 or 760 depending on the number of channels it can accommodate. The 720 and 760 use 0.025 MHz, 25 kHz, kHz spacing, 118.025, 118.050, with the 720 having a frequency range up to 135.975 MHz and the 760 reaching up to 136.975 MHz. VHF radios are limited to line-of-sight transmissions, therefore, aircraft at higher altitudes are able to transmit and receive at greater distances. In March of 1997, the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, amended its international standards and recommended practices to incorporate a channel plan specifying 8.33 kHz channel spacings in the aeronautical mobile service. The 8.33 kHz channel plan was adopted to alleviate the shortage of VHF ATC channels experienced in Western Europe and in the United Kingdom. Seven Western European countries and the United Kingdom implemented the 8.33 kHz channel plan on January 1, 1999. Accordingly, Aircraft operating in the airspace of these countries must have the capability of transmitting and receiving on the 8.33 kHz space channels. Using proper radio procedures using proper radio phraseology and procedures contribute to a pilot's ability to operate safely and efficiently in the airspace system. A review of the pilot-slash-controller glossary contained in the AIM assists a pilot in the use and understanding of. Figure 1440 Traffic Pattern Operation, Parallel Runways Standard Terminology The AIM also contains many examples of radio communications. ICAO has adopted a phonetic alphabet that should be used in radio communications. When communicating with ATC, pilots should use this alphabet to identify their aircraft. Figure 1441, Lost Communication Procedures It is possible that a pilot might experience a malfunction of the radio. This might cause the transmitter, receiver, or both to become inoperative. If a receiver becomes inoperative and a pilot needs to land at a towered airport, it is advisable to remain outside or above Class D airspace until the direction and flow of traffic is determined. A pilot should then advise the tower of the aircraft type, position, altitude, and intention to land. The pilot should continue, enter the pattern, report a position as appropriate, and watch for light signals from the tower. Light signal colors and their meanings are contained in figure 1442. If the transmitter becomes inoperative, a pilot should follow the previously stated procedures and also monitor the appropriate ATC frequency. During daylight hours, ATC transmissions may be acknowledged by rocking the wings, and at night by blinking the landing light. When both receiver and transmitter are inoperative, the pilot should remain outside of Class D airspace until the flow of traffic has been determined and then enter the pattern and watch for light signals. Radio malfunctions should be repaired before further flight. If this is not possible, ATC may be contacted by telephone requesting a VFR departure without two-way radio communications. No radio, Nordo, procedure arrivals are not accepted at busy airports. If authorization is given to depart, the pilot is advised to monitor the appropriate frequency and or watch for light signals as appropriate. If radio communication is lost, 
it may be a prudent decision to land at a non-towered airport with lower traffic volume, if practical. When operating at a non-towered airport, no radio communication is necessary. However, pilots should be extra vigilant when not using the radio. Other traffic may not as easily be aware of your presence when they are expecting the standard radio calls. Air Traffic Control, ATC, services besides the services provided by an FSS as discussed in Chapter 12, Aviation Weather Services, numerous other services are provided by ATC. In many instances a pilot is required to have contact with ATC, but even when not required, a pilot may find their services helpful. Primary radar radar is a device that provides information on range, azimuth, and or elevation of objects in the path of the transmitted pulses. It measures the time interval between transmission and reception of radio pulses and correlates the angular orientation of the radiated antenna beam or beams in azimuth and or elevation. Range is determined by measuring the time it takes for the radio wave to go out to the object and then return to the receiving antenna. The direction of a detected object from a radar site is determined by the position of the rotating antenna when the reflected portion of the radio wave is received. Modern radar is very reliable and there are seldom outages. This is due to reliable maintenance and improved equipment. There are, however, some limitations that may affect ATC services and prevent a controller from issuing advisories concerning aircraft that are not under his or her control and cannot be seen on radar. The characteristics of radio waves are such that they normally travel in a continuous straight line unless they are bent by atmospheric phenomena, such as temperature inversions, reflected or attenuated by dense objects such as heavy clouds and precipitation, or screened by high terrain features. Radar signals degrade over distance, cannot penetrate through solid objects such as mountains, and the fastest radar updates every 4.7 seconds. By contrast, the satellite signals used with automatic dependent surveillance minus broadcast, adds minus B, do not degrade over distance, provide better visibility around mountainous terrain, and allows equipped aircraft to update their own position once a second with better accuracy. ATC Radar Beacon System, at curves, the ATC Radar Beacon System, at curves, is often referred to as secondary surveillance radar. This system consists of three components and helps in alleviating some of the limitations associated with primary radar. The three components are an interrogator, transponder, and radar scope. The advantages of at curves are the reinforcement of radar targets, rapid target identification, and a unique display of selected codes. Growing air traffic in the National Airspace System, NAS, will be addressed through the use of ADS-B, which not only provides all the same information the at curves, but will do so more rapidly and with significantly more accuracy. By broadcasting aircraft position information to a ground station, ADS-B can also provide coverage in areas that do not have radar coverage. In addition, ADS-B provides trajectory information that includes speed and direction of motion. Transponder The transponder is the airborne portion of the secondary surveillance radar system and a system with which a pilot should be familiar. The at curves cannot display the secondary information unless an aircraft is equipped with a transponder. A transponder is also required to operate in certain controlled airspace as discussed in Chapter 15, Airspace. A transponder code consists of four numbers from 0 to 7, 4096 possible codes. There are some standard codes or ATC may issue a four-digit code to an aircraft. When a controller requests a code or function on the transponder, the word squawk may be used. Figure 14 to 43 lists some standard transponder phraseology. Additional information concerning transponder operation can be found in the AIM Chapter 4. Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast ADS-B, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Minus Broadcast, ADS-B, is a surveillance technology being deployed throughout the NAS to facilitate improvements needed to increase the capacity and efficiency of the NAS, while maintaining safety. ADS-B supports these improvements by providing a higher update rate and enhanced accuracy of surveillance information over the current radar-based surveillance system. In addition, ADS-B enables the expansion of air traffic control, ATC, surveillance services into areas where none existed previously. The ADS-B ground system also provides Traffic Information Services Broadcast, TISB, and Flight Information Services Broadcast, FISB, for use on appropriately equipped aircraft, enhancing the user's situational awareness, SA, and improving the overall safety of the NAS. The ADS-B system is composed of aircraft avionics and a ground infrastructure. Onboard avionics determine the position of the aircraft by using the GPS and transmit its position, along with additional information about the aircraft to ground stations for use by ATC and nearby ADS-B equipped aircraft. 
In the United States, ADS minus B equipped aircraft exchange information on one of two frequencies, 978 or 1090 MHz. The 1090 MHz frequency is associated with mode A, C, and S transponder operations. 1090 MHz transponders with integrated ADS minus B functionality extend the transponder message sets with additional ADS minus B information. This additional information is known as an extended squitter message and referred to as 1090S. ADS minus B equipment operating on 978 MHz is known as the Universal Access Transceiver, UAT. Radar Traffic Advisories Radar equipped ATC facilities provide radar assistance to aircraft on instrument flight plans and VFR aircraft provided the aircraft can communicate with the facility and are within radar coverage. This basic service includes safety alerts, traffic advisories, limited vectoring when requested, and sequencing at locations where this procedure has been established. ATC issues traffic advisories based on observed radar targets. The traffic is referenced by azimuth from the aircraft in terms of the 12-hour clock. Also, distance in nautical miles, direction in which the target is moving, and type and altitude of the aircraft, if known, are given. An example would be, traffic 10 o'clock 5 miles eastbound, Cessna 152, 3000 feet. The pilot should note that traffic position is based on the aircraft track and that wind correction can affect the clock position at which a pilot locates traffic. This service is not intended to relieve the pilot of the responsibility to see and avoid other aircraft. Figure 1444, in addition to basic radar service, terminal radar service area, TRSA, has been implemented at certain terminal locations. TRSAs are depicted on sectional aeronautical charts and listed in the chart supplement US, formerly airport slash facility directory. The purpose of this service is to provide separation between all participating VFR aircraft and all IFR aircraft operating within the TRSA. Class C service provides approved separation between IFR and VFR aircraft and sequencing of VFR aircraft to the primary airport. Class B service provides approved separation of aircraft based on IFR, VFR, and or weight and sequencing of VFR arrivals to the primary airports. Wake turbulence All aircraft generate wake turbulence during flight. This disturbance is caused by a pair of counter-rotating vortices trailing from the wingtips. The vortices from larger aircraft pose problems to encountering aircraft. The wake of these aircraft can impose rolling moments exceeding the roll control authority of the encountering aircraft. Also, the turbulence generated within the vortices can damage aircraft components and equipment if encountered at close range. For this reason, a pilot must envision the location of the vortex wake and adjust the flight path accordingly. Vortex generation lift is generated by the creation of a pressure differential over the wing surface. The lowest pressure occurs over the upper wing surface and the highest pressure under the wing. This pressure differential triggers the roll-up of the airflow after the wing resulting in swirling air masses trailing downstream of the wingtips. After the roll-up is completed, the wake consists of two counter-rotating cylindrical vortices. Most of the energy lies within a few feet of the center of each vortex. Figure 1445 Vortex strength terminal area wake turbulence has historically been thought of as only a function of aircraft weight, but recent research considers additional parameters, such as speed, aspects of the wing, wake decay rates, and aircraft resistance to wake, just to name a few. The vortex characteristics of any aircraft will be changed with the extension of flaps or other wing configuration devices, as well as changing speed. However, as the basic factors are weight and speed, the vortex strength increases proportionally with an increase in aircraft operating weight or decrease in aircraft speed. The greatest vortex strength occurs when the generating aircraft is heavy, slow, and clean, since the turbulence from a dirty aircraft configuration hastens wake decay. On route on route wake turbulence events have been influenced by changes to the aircraft fleet mix that have more super, A380, and heavy, B747, B777, A340, etc. Aircraft operating in the NAS. There have been wake turbulence events in excess of 30 nautical miles and 2,000 feet lower than the wake generating aircraft. Air density is also a factor in wake strength. Even though the speeds are higher in crews at high altitude, the reduced air density may result in wake strength comparable to that in the terminal area. In addition, for a given separation distance, the higher speeds in crews result in less time for the wake to decay before being encountered by a trailing aircraft. Vortex behavior trailing vortices have certain behavioral characteristics that can help a pilot visualize the wake location and take avoidance precautions. Vortices are generated from the moment an aircraft leaves the ground, 
until it touches down, since trailing vortices are the byproduct of wing lift. Figure 1446, the vortex circulation is outward, upward, and around the wingtips when viewed from either ahead or behind the aircraft. Tests with large Aircraft have shown that vortices remain spaced a bit less than a wingspan apart, drifting with the wind, at altitudes greater than a wingspan from the ground. Tests have also shown that the vortices sink at a rate of several hundred feet per minute, slowing their descent and diminishing in strength with time and distance behind the generating aircraft. When the vortices of larger aircraft sink close to the ground, within 100 to 200 feet, they tend to move laterally over the ground at a speed of 2 to 3 knots. A crosswind decreases the lateral movement of the upwind vortex and increases the movement of the downwind vortex. A light quartering tailwind presents the worst-case scenario as the wake vortices could be all present along a significant portion of the final approach and extended centerline and not just in the touchdown zone as typically expected. Vortex avoidance procedures The following procedures are in place to assist pilots in vortex avoidance in the given scenario. Landing behind a larger aircraft on the same runway, stay at or above the larger aircraft's approach flight path and land beyond its touchdown point. Figure 1447A Landing behind a larger aircraft on a parallel runway closer than 2,500 feet, consider the possibility of drift and stay at or above the larger aircraft's final approach flight path and note its touchdown point. Figure 1447b, landing behind a larger aircraft on crossing runway, cross above the larger aircraft's flight path. Landing behind a departing aircraft on the same runway, land prior to the departing aircraft's rotating point. Landing behind a larger aircraft on a crossing runway, Note the aircraft's rotation point and, if that point is past the intersection, continue and land prior to the intersection. If the larger aircraft rotates prior to the intersection, avoid flight below its flight path. Abandon the approach unless a landing is ensured well before reaching the intersection. Figure 1447C. Departing behind a large aircraft, rotate prior to the large aircraft's rotation point and climb above its climb path until turning clear of the wake. For intersection takeoffs on the same runway. Be alert to adjacent larger aircraft operations, particularly upwind of the runway of intended use. If an intersection takeoff clearance is received, avoid headings that cross below the larger aircraft's path. If departing or landing after a large aircraft executing, a low approach, missed approach, or touch and go landing, since vortices settle and move laterally near the ground, the vortex hazard may exist along the runway and in the flight path, particularly in a quartering tailwind, it is prudent to wait at least two minutes prior to a takeoff or landing. En route, it is advisable to avoid a path below and behind a large aircraft, and if a large aircraft is observed above on the same track, change the aircraft position laterally and preferably upwind. Collision Avoidance Title 14 of the CFR Part 91 has established right-of-way rules, minimum safe altitudes, and VFR cruising altitudes to enhance flight safety. The pilot can contribute to collision avoidance by being alert and scanning for other aircraft. This is particularly important in the vicinity of an airport. Effective scanning is accomplished with a series of short, regularly spaced eye movements that bring successive areas of the sky into the central visual field. Each movement should not exceed 10 degrees, and each should be observed for at least one second to enable detection. Although back and forth eye movements seem preferred by most pilots, each pilot should develop a scanning pattern that is most comfortable and then adhere to it to assure optimum scanning. Even if entitled to the right of way, a pilot should yield if another aircraft seems too close. Clearing procedures The following procedures and considerations are in place to assist pilots in collision avoidance under various situations. Before takeoff, prior to taxiing onto a runway or landing area in preparation for takeoff, pilots should scan the approach area for possible landing traffic, executing appropriate maneuvers to provide a clear view of the approach areas. Climbs and descents During climbs and descents in flight conditions that permit visual detection of other traffic, Pilots should execute gentle banks left and right at a frequency that permits continuous visual scanning of the airspace. Straight and level, during sustained periods of straight and level flight, a pilot should execute appropriate clearing procedures at periodic intervals. Traffic patterns, entries into traffic patterns while descending should be avoided. Traffic at VOR sites, due to converging traffic, sustained vigilance should be maintained in the vicinity of VORs and intersections. Training operations, vigilance should be maintained and clearing turns should be made prior to a practice. Maneuver. During instruction, the pilot should be asked to verbalize the clearing procedures, call out clear left, 
right, above, and below. High wing and low wing aircraft have their respective blind spots. The pilot of a high wing aircraft should momentarily raise the wing in the direction of the intended turn and look for traffic prior to commencing the turn. The pilot of a low wing aircraft should momentarily lower the wing and look for traffic prior to commencing the turn. Pilot deviations, PDs, a pilot deviation, PD, is an action of a pilot that violates any federal aviation regulation. While PDs should be avoided, the regulations do authorize deviations from a clearance in response to a traffic alert and collision avoidance system resolution advisory. You must notify ATC as soon as possible following a deviation. Pilot deviations can occur in several different ways. Airborne deviations result when a pilot strays from an assigned heading or altitude or from an instrument procedure, or if the pilot penetrates controlled or restricted airspace without ATC clearance. To prevent airborne deviations, follow these steps. Plan each flight. You may have flown the flight many times before but conditions and situations can change rapidly, such as in the case of a pop-up temporary flight restriction, TFR. Take a few minutes prior to each flight to plan accordingly. Talk and squawk, proper communication with ATC has its benefits. Flight following often makes the controller's job easier because they can better integrate VFR and IFR traffic. Give yourself some room, GPS is usually more precise than ATC radar. Using your GPS to fly up to and along the line of the airspace you are trying to avoid could result in a pilot deviation because ATC radar may show you within the restricted airspace. Ground deviations, also called surface deviations, include taxiing, taking off, or landing without clearance, deviating from an assigned taxi route, or failing to hold short of an assigned clearance limit. To prevent ground deviations, stay alert during ground operations. Pilot deviations can infrequently do occur on the ground. Many strategies and tactics pilots use to avoid airborne deviations also work on the ground. Pilots should also remain vigilant about vehicle-slash-pedestrian deviations, V-slash-PDs. A vehicle or pedestrian deviation includes pedestrians, vehicles or other objects interfering with aircraft operations by entering or moving on the runway movement area without authorization from air traffic control. In serious instances, any ground deviation, PD or VPD, can result in a runway incursion. Best practices in preventing ground deviations can be found in the following section under Runway Incursion Avoidance. Runway Incursion Avoidance A runway incursion is any occurrence in the airport runway environment involving an aircraft, vehicle, person, or object on the ground that creates a collision hazard or results in a loss of required separation with an aircraft taking off, intending to take off landing, or intending to land. It is important to give the same attention to operating on the surface as in other phases of flights. Proper planning can prevent runway incursions and the possibility of a ground collision. A pilot should always be aware of the aircraft's position on the surface at all times and be aware of other aircraft and vehicle operations on the airport. At times, towered airports can be busy and taxi instructions complex. In this situation, it may be advisable to write down taxi instructions. The following are some practices to help prevent a runway incursion. Read back all runway crossing and or hold instructions. Review airport layouts as part of pre-flight planning, before descending to land and while taxiing, as needed. No airport signage. Review notum for information on runway-slash-taxiway closures and construction areas. Request progressive taxi instructions from ATC when unsure of a taxi route. Check for traffic before crossing any runway hold line and before entering a taxiway. Turn on aircraft lights and the rotating beacon or strobe lights while taxiing. When landing, clear the active runway as soon as possible, then wait for taxi instructions before further movement. Study and use proper phraseology in order to understand and respond to ground control instructions. Write down complex taxi instructions at unfamiliar airports. Approximately three runway incursions occur each day at towered airports within the United States. The potential that these numbers present for a catastrophic accident is unacceptable. The following are examples of pilot deviations, operational incidents, or in vehicle driver deviations that may lead to runway incursions. Pilot deviations. Crossing a runway hold marking without clearance from ATC, taking off without clearance, landing without clearance operational incidents, OI. Clearing an aircraft onto a runway while another aircraft is landing on the same runway, Issuing a takeoff clearance while the runway is occupied by another aircraft or vehicle vehicle driver deviations. Crossing a runway hold marking without ATC clearance according to FAA data, 
approximately 65% of all runway incursions are caused by pilots. Of the pilot runway incursions, FAA data shows almost half of those incursions are caused by GA pilots. Causal factors of runway incursions Detailed investigations of runway incursions over the past 10 years have identified three major areas contributing to these events. Failure to comply with ATC instructions, lack of airport familiarity, nonconformance with standard operating procedures clear, concise, and effective pilot-slash-controller communication is paramount to safe airport surface operations. You must fully understand and comply with all ATC instructions. It is mandatory to read back all runway hold short instructions verbatim. Taxiing on an unfamiliar airport can be very challenging, especially during hours of darkness or low visibility. A request may be made for progressive taxi instructions which include step-by-step taxi routing instructions. Ensure you have a current airport diagram, remain heads up with eyes outside, and devote your entire attention to surface navigation per ATC clearance. All checklists should be completed while the aircraft is stopped. There is no place for non-essential chatter or other activities while maintaining vigilance during taxi. Figure 1448, Runway confusion Runway confusion is a subset of runway incursions and often results in you unintentionally taking off or landing on a taxiway or wrong runway. Generally, you are unaware of the mistake until after it has occurred. In August 2006, the flight crew of a commercial regional jet was cleared for takeoff on runway 22 but mistakenly lined up and departed on runway 26, a much shorter runway. As a result, the aircraft crashed off the end of the runway. Causal factors of runway confusion There are three major factors that increase the risk of runway confusion and can lead to a wrong runway departure. Airport complexity, close proximity of runway thresholds, joint use of a runway as a taxiway Not only can airport complexity contribute to a runway incursion, it can also play a significant role in runway confusion. If you are operating at an unfamiliar airport and need assistance in executing the taxi clearance, do not hesitate to ask ATC for help. Always carry a current airport diagram and trace or highlight your taxi route to the departure runway prior to leaving the ramp. If you are operating from an airport with runway thresholds in close proximity to one another, exercise extreme caution when taxiing onto the runway. Figure 1449 shows a perfect example of a taxiway leading to multiple runways that may cause confusion. If departing on runway 36, ensure that you set your aircraft heading bug to 360 degrees, and align your aircraft to the runway heading to avoid departing from the wrong runway. Before adding power, make one last instrument scan to ensure the aircraft heading and runway heading are aligned. Under certain circumstances, it may be necessary to use a runway as a taxiway. For example, during airport construction some taxiways may be closed requiring rerouting of traffic onto runways. In other cases, Departing traffic may be required to back taxi on the runway in order to utilize the full runway length. Runway incursion, it is important to remain extremely cautious and maintain situational awareness, SA. When instructed to use a runway as a taxiway, do not become confused and take off on the runway you are using as a taxiway. ATC Instructions Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, 14 CFR, Part 91, Section 91.123 requires you to follow all ATC clearances and instructions. Request clarification if you are unsure of the clearance or instruction to be followed. If you are unfamiliar with the airport or unsure of a taxi route, ask ATC for a progressive taxi. Progressive taxi requires the controller to provide step-by-step taxi instructions. The final decision to act on ATC's instruction rests with you. If you cannot safely comply with any of ATC's instructions, inform them immediately by using the word unable. There is nothing wrong with telling a controller that you are unable to safely comply with the clearance. Another way to mitigate the risk of runway incursions is to write down all taxi instructions as soon as they are received from ATC. Figure 1450, it is also helpful to monitor ATC clearances and instructions that are issued to other aircraft. You should be especially vigilant if another aircraft has a similar sounding call sign so there is no mistake about who ATC is contacting or to whom they are giving instructions and clearances. Read back your complete ATC clearance with your aircraft call sign. This gives ATC the opportunity to clarify any misunderstandings and ensure that instructions were given to the correct aircraft. If, at any time, there is uncertainty about any ATC instructions or clearances, ask ATC to say again or ask for progressive taxi instructions. ATC instructions, hold short the most important sign and marking on the airport is the hold sign and hold marking. These are located on a stub taxiway leading directly to a runway. 
they depict the holding position or the location where the aircraft is to stop so as not to enter the runway environment. Figure 1451, for example, figure 1452 shows the holding position sign and marking for runway 13 and runway 31. When ATC issues a hold short clearance, you are expected to taxi up to, but not cross any part of the runway holding marking. At a towered airport, runway hold markings should never be crossed without explicit ATC instructions. Do not enter a runway at a towered airport unless instructions are given from ATC to cross, take off from, or line up and wait on that specific runway. ATC is required to obtain a read back from the pilot of all runway hold short instructions. Therefore, you must read back the entire clearance and hold short instruction, to include runway identifier and your call sign. Traffic before crossing the hold position marking. Figure 1453 shows an example of a controller's taxi and hold short instructions and the reply from the pilot. ATC instructions, explicit runway crossing as of June 30, 2010, ATC is required to issue explicit instructions to cross or hold short of each runway. Instructions to cross a runway are normally issued one at a time, and an aircraft must have crossed the previous runway before another runway crossing is issued. Exceptions may apply for closely spaced runways that have less than 1,000 feet between centerlines. This applies to all runways to include active, inactive, or closed. Figure 1454 shows communication between ATC and a pilot who is requesting a taxi clearance. Extra caution should be used when directed by ATC to taxi onto or across a runway, especially at night and during reduced visibility conditions. Always comply with hold short or crossing instructions when approaching an entrance to a runway. Scan the full length of the runway and the final approaches before entering or crossing any runway, even if ATC has issued a clearance. ATC instructions, line up and wait, LUAW, ATC now uses the line up and wait, LUAW, instruction when a takeoff clearance cannot be issued immediately due to traffic or other reasons. The words line up and wait have replaced position and hold in directing you to taxi onto a runway and await takeoff clearance. An ATC instruction to line up and wait is not a clearance for takeoff. It is only a clearance to enter the runway and hold in position for takeoff. Under Lua phraseology, the controller states the aircraft call sign, departure runway, and line up and wait. Be aware that traffic holding in position will continue to be used to advise other aircraft that traffic has been authorized to line up and wait on an active runway. Pay close attention when instructed to line up and wait, especially at night or during periods of low visibility before. Entering the runway, remember to scan the full length of the runway and its approach end for other aircraft. There have been collisions and incidents involving aircraft instructed to line up and wait while ATC waits for the necessary conditions to issue a takeoff clearance. An OI caused a 737 to land on a runway occupied by a twin-engine turboprop. The turboprop was holding in position awaiting takeoff clearance. Upon landing, the 737 collided with the twin-engine turboprop. When ATC instructs you to line up and wait, they should advise you of any anticipated delay in receiving your takeoff clearance. Possible reasons for ATC takeoff clearance delays may include other aircraft landing in or departing, weak turbulence, or traffic crossing an intersecting runway. If advised of a reason for the delay, or the reason is, clearly visible, expect an imminent takeoff clearance once the reason is no longer an issue. If a takeoff clearance is not received within 90 seconds, after receiving the line-up and wait instruction, contact ATC immediately. When ATC issues line-up and wait instructions, and takeoff clearances from taxiway intersection, the taxiway designator is included. Example, N123 AG Runway 18, at Charlie 3, line-up and wait. Example, N123 AG Runway 18, at Charlie 3, cleared for takeoff. If LUA procedures are being used and landing traffic is a factor, ATC is required to inform the aircraft in the LUA position of the closest aircraft that is requesting a full stop, touch and go, stop and go option, or unrestricted low approach. Example, N123 AG, runway 18, line up and wait, traffic a Cessna 210 on a 6-mile final. In some cases, where safety logic is being used, ATC is permitted to issue landing clearances with traffic in the LUA position. Traffic information is issued to the landing traffic. Example, N456HK, runway 18, clear to land, traffic at a Havilland Otter holding in position. Note, ATC will slash must issue a takeoff clearance to the traffic holding in position in sufficient time to ensure no conflict exists with landing aircraft. 
prescribed runway separation must exist no later than when the landing aircraft crosses the threshold. In cases where ATC is not permitted to issue landing clearances with traffic in the low opposition, traffic information is issued to the closest aircraft that is requesting a full stop, touch and go, stop and go option, or unrestricted low approach. Example, N456HK, runway 18, continue, traffic holding in position. ATC instructions, runway shorten you should review NOTAMs in your pre-flight planning to determine any airport changes that will affect your departure or arrival. When the available runway length has been temporarily or permanently shortened due to construction, the ATIS includes the words warning and shortened in the text of the message. For the duration of the construction when the runway is temporarily shortened, ATC will include the word shortened in their clearance instructions. Furthermore, the use of the term full length will not be used by ATC during this period of the construction. Some examples of ATC instructions are, runway 36 shortened, line up and wait. Runway 36 shortened, cleared for takeoff. Runway 36 shortened, cleared to land. When an intersection departure is requested on a temporarily or permanently shortened runway during the construction, the remaining length of runway is included in the clearance. For example, runway 36 at Echo, intersection departure, 5,600 feet available. If following the construction, the runway is permanently shortened, ATC will include the word shortened until the chart supplement US, formerly airport slash facility directory, is updated to include the permanent changes to the runway length. Pre-landing, landing, and after landing while en route and after receiving the destination airport at a slash landing information, review the airport diagram and brief yourself as to your exit taxiway. Determine the following. Are there any runway hold markings in close proximity to the exit taxiway? Do not cross any hold markings or exit onto any runways without ATC clearance. After landing, use the utmost caution where the exit taxiways intersect another runway, and do not exit onto another runway without ATC authorization. Do not accept last-minute turnoff instructions from the control tower unless you clearly understand the instructions and are at a speed that ensures you can safely comply. Finally, after landing and upon exiting the runway, ensure your aircraft has completely crossed over the runway hold markings. Once all parts of the aircraft have crossed the runway holding position markings, you must hold unless further instructions have been issued by ATC. Do not initiate non-essential communications or actions until the aircraft has stopped and the brakes set. Engineered Materials Arresting Systems, EMAS, aircraft can and do overrun the ends of runways and sometimes with devastating results. An overrun occurs when an aircraft passes beyond the end of a runway during an aborted takeoff or on landing rollout. To minimize the hazards of overruns, the FAA incorporated the concept of a runway safety area, RSA, beyond the runway end into airport design standards. At most commercial airports, the RSA is 500 feet wide and extends 1,000 feet beyond each end of the runway. The FAA implemented this requirement in the event that an aircraft overruns, undershoots, or veers off the side of the runway. The most dangerous of these incidents are overruns, but since many airports were built before the 1,000-foot RSA length was adopted some 20 years ago, the area beyond the end of the runway is where many airports cannot achieve the full standard RSA. This is due to obstacles, such as bodies of water, highways, railroads, populated areas, or severe drop-off of terrain. Under these specific circumstances, the installation of an Engineered Materials Arresting System, EMAS, is an acceptable alternative to a RSA beyond the runway end. It provides a level of safety that is generally equivalent to a full RSA. Figure 1455, an EMAS uses materials of closely controlled strength and density placed at the end of a runway to stop or greatly slow an aircraft that overruns the runway. The best material found to date is a lightweight, crushable concrete. When an aircraft rolls into an EMA's arrestor bed, the tires of the aircraft sink into the lightweight concrete and the aircraft is decelerated by having to roll through the material. Figure 1456, Incidents to date, there have been several incidents listed below where the EMA's technology has worked successfully to arrest aircraft that overrun the runway. All cases have resulted in minimal to do damage to the aircraft. The only known injury was an ankle injury to a passenger during egress following the arrestment. Figure 1457, May 1999, a Saab 340 commuter aircraft overran the runway at John F. Kennedy International Airport, JFK. May 2003, a cargo McDonnell Douglas, MD-11 overran the runway at JFK. January 2005, a Boeing 747 overran the runway at JFK. 
July 2006, a Mystere Falcon 900 overran the runway at Greenville Downtown Airport, KGMU, in Greenville, South Carolina. July 2008, an Airbus A320 overran the runway at O'Hare International Airport, ORD. January 2010, a Bombardier CRJ-200 regional jet overran the runway at Jaeger Airport, KCRW, in Charleston, West Virginia, WV. Figure 1458, October 2010, a G4 Gulfstream overran the runway at Teterboro Airport, KTEB, in Teterboro, New Jersey, NJ. November 2011, a Cessna Citation 550 overran the runway at Key West International Airport, KEYW, in Key West, Florida. EMMA's installations and information currently, EMMA's is installed at 63 runway ends at 42 airports in the United States with plans to install more throughout the next few years. EMMA's information is available in the Chart Supplement U.S., formerly Airport Slash Facility Directory, under the specific airport information. Figure 1459 shows airport information for Boston Logan International Airport. At the bottom of the page, it shows which runways are equipped with arresting systems and the type that they have. It is important for pilots to study airport information, become familiar with the details and limitations of the arresting system, and the runways that are equipped with them. Figure 1460 Pilot considerations Although engaging in EMA should not be a desired outcome for the end of a flight, pilots need to know what EMA's is, how to identify it on the airfield diagram and on the airfield, as well as knowing what to do should they find themselves approaching an installation in an overrun situation. Figure 1459 and Figure 1460, pilots also need to know that an EMA's may not stop lightweight general aviation aircraft that are not heavy enough to sink into the crushable concrete. The time to discuss whether or not a runway has an EMA's at the end is during the pre-departure briefing prior to takeoff or during the approach briefing prior to commencing the approach. Following the guidance below ensures that the aircraft engages the EMAs according to the design entry parameters. During the takeoff or landing phase, if a pilot determines that the aircraft will exit the runway end and enter the EMAs, the following guidance should be adhered to. 1. Continue deceleration, regardless of aircraft speed upon exiting the runway. Continue to follow rejected slash aborted takeoff procedures, or if landing, maximum braking procedures outlined in the flight manual. 2. Maintain runway centerline not veering left or right of the bed and continuing straight ahead will maximize stopping capability of the EMA's bed. The quality of deceleration will be best within the confines of the bed. 3. Maintain deceleration efforts. The arrestor bed is a passive system, so this is the only action required by the pilot. 4. Once stopped, do not attempt to taxi or otherwise move the aircraft. Chapter Summary This chapter focused on airport operations both in the air and on the surface. For specific information about an unfamiliar airport, consult the Chart Supplement U.S., formerly Airport Slash Facility Directory, and Notams Before Flying. For further information regarding procedures discussed in this chapter, refer to 14 CFR Part 91 in the AIM. By adhering to established procedures, both airport operations and safety are enhanced. This chapter is also designed to help you attain an understanding of the risks associated with surface navigation and is intended to provide you with basic information regarding the safe operation of aircraft at towered and non-towered airports. This chapter focuses on the following major areas. Runway incursion overview, taxi route planning, taxi procedures, communications, airport signs, markings and lighting. The chapter identifies best practices to help you avoid errors that may potentially lead to runway incursions. Although the chapter pertains mostly to surface movements for single pilot operations, all of the information is relevant for flight crew operations as well. Additional information about surface operations is available through the following sources. Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, Runway Safety Website, www.fa.gov slash go slash runway safety, FAA National Aeronautical Navigation Services, Aeronav, formerly known as the National Aeronautical Charting Office, NACO www.fa gov slash air underscore traffic slash flight underscore info slash aeronav, chart supplement US, formerly airport slash facility directory, www.fa.gov slash air underscore traffic slash flight underscore info slash aeronav slash digital underscore product slash daft slash search slash automatic terminal information service, ATIS, notice to airmen notams, http colon slash slash www.fa.gov slash pilots slash flt underscore plan slash notams advisory circular ac 91 to 73 
Part 91 and Part 135, Single Pilot and Flight School Procedures During Taxi Operations, Aeronautical Information Manual, AIMWWW.FA. Gov slash air underscore traffic slash publication slash at pub slash aim slash AC 12074, parts 91, 121, 125, and 135, flight crew procedures during taxi operations. Facility Directory.